All right, well, welcome. You ready for some systematic theology? All right, yeah. So we're going to do uh, 12 weeks of this. And uh, this is the first go around. There'll be actually three sections of this because obviously there's a lot to systematic theology. And, and in many ways, we'll just be uh, kind of scratching the surface on, on some aspects of this because there's just so much uh, to it. Uh, so what we're looking at this time around is um, kind of an introduction to uh, systematic theology and then uh, looking at the revelation of God. We'll, we'll start next time with the, the revelation of God, and that's specifically going to move us towards Scripture itself. There's some, some different aspects of revelation we'll talk about, but it'll move us pretty quickly towards uh, Scripture and then from there, we will uh, talk about uh, theology proper, as they call it, which is the study of God himself and his attributes. Uh, you know, he is Trinity and, and these kinds of things. And then we'll talk about the, the work of God, uh, specifically creation and, and providence. So that's, that's what we're going to get through this time. That's a, that's a pretty big chunk, obviously, but um, uh, that's where we're going to be moving towards. Um, so this first lesson is actually going to be uh, studying God himself. So sort of a, an introduction to this. Now, <clears throat> the, um, the theology book that I, I've chosen as required reading, really for those who are going through for certification, is Wayne Grudem's uh, Systematic Theology. And um, one of the reasons I, I chose this is it's very popular now. It's uh, very readable. He, he does it in a way that is uh, uh, very understandable and, and, and easy to read for systematic theology. So um, it's very accessible to a, to a lot of people. Uh, it's, I don't think, I'm going to talk about some other systematic theologies in just a moment. I actually don't think it's the best systematic theology that's out there. And... Um, but because it's so readable and so accessible, it's, um, it, it's the one that, that uh, I'm, I'm putting forth for reading. And it will, um, uh, I, I have a reading schedule I, I put on the, the GroupMe app, and if you didn't get that, let me know afterwards, and, and we'll get that set up where you can get it uh, to, to help you move along with this. Now, I... What I'm not going to do, just so you'll know up front, is I, I'm not going to go through Grudem's Systematic Theology. So I'm, I'm not assigning this for you to read, and then, okay, now we're going to talk about what Grudem wrote. Okay, my approach is there's a lot of stuff in there and a lot of good stuff, and you'll get a lot from reading him, but we're going to kind of go parallel with him. Yeah, so hopefully you'll get two things in there. And Grudem does also have, um, for those who don't want to read a big systematic theology, he, he has some um, where he's kind of simplified it a little bit more. I think it's called Bible Doctrines. Um, he's, got, he's got a smaller book out there that's, um, that that's good for, for reading as well. But just to let you know, that's, that's the basis for the reading is Grudem's systematic theology. Now, here's, here's some others that I would recommend for you to read as you, as you have time and desire to over, over the years. Uh, John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, uh, kind of a, uh, for anybody in reform world, this kind of required reading at, at some point uh, kind of deal, or at least parts of it. You want to read something in there so you can say, yeah, I've read uh, Calvin's Institutes of Christian Religion, at least parts of it. Francis Turretin who uh, kind of followed after Calvin, um, also um, very good. Uh, Charles Hodge, systematic theology. Charles Hodge was a um, Presbyterian theologian, 1871-1873 is when his um, was written and published. Herman Bavinck, um, Reformed Dogmatics is the name of his. He is kind of resurgence of interest in, in Bavinck. Again, you can see him late 1800s, early 1900s when he left. Uh, kind of Dutch reform guy. And um, kind of re resurgence in interest of him because his works have just been translated into English in the last few years. 
and uh, he's got like a three volume um, uh, reform dogmatics. So a lot there. But then the guy who translated his works over has actually now abridged that into one volume. And so for anybody who's going to, and, and he is, he's got some really good stuff. Uh, so anybody who's going to read him, unless you really, really are into it, I'd say get the abridged uh, volume and, and read it. Uh, Louis Burkhoff, uh, in Presbyterian circles for years and years and years, he's pretty much been the go-to guy, and even in, in other circles as well. But, um, but uh, Presbyterian, Systematic Theology, 1932, so uh, that's another resource for you. Robert Raymond, um, 1998, so more modern times. He kind of wrote his, again, more readable than some of this older stuff because our language kind of changes over time, right? Even English, it changes from 100 years ago. It, it changes, and so we... we Sometimes when you read these older volumes 100, 200 years ago, especially a couple, couple hundred years ago, it's like, wow, I've, I've really got to figure out what they're saying here before I can even understand what they're talking about in the content of systematic theology. And again, that's one reason why Grudem is, is so good. But Raymond also uh, tried to update things, and he really wanted his to replace Burkhoff's as kind of a, a textbook in the theology classes, and I, I don't think it's done it. I think everybody's kind of, for the most part, kind of holding on to Burkhoff. Uh, one of my favorites, I did my dissertation on John Gill, so of course he's he's one of my favorites. Um, the, these that have gone before were um, Pado baptists so believe in baptizing babies. Now we're getting into some of the Baptists. And, and John Gill wrote a complete body of doctrinal and practical divinity. So really two volumes brought together in one. And um, really for, for his time and, and really down to the modern day, into the recent years anyhow, he was a premier Baptist theologian. So has a lot of important things to say from the Baptist perspective. If you want a Baptist perspective, especially from, you see, the 1700s, so a different time period. Um, his is good to to check out, and um, the the thing about um, modern theology books and modern commentaries, for that matter, um, the the thing about them is that the benefit of them is they're new. Okay, so they're contemporary, so they're going to cover contemporary issues that may not have existed in older times, at least in the way that they're presented. So, so that's why the more modern things can be good. The negative about the modern books, I always say, is that they're modern. Uh, so they don't deal with, a lot of times, the things that the older ones deal with. And so sometimes they you, you miss out on, on some important um, aspects of things. James Pettigrew Boyce, uh, founder of Southern Seminary, has an abstract of systematic theology uh, written in 1887, another obviously Baptist. Uh, John Dagg uh, wrote a manual of theology. I believe this one's available online that you can actually, and some of these older ones are because they're not copyrighted, so you'll find, you can actually Google them and find them. So if you're ever doing uh, researching a topic, and uh, so you get Grudem's idea about what this topic is, like the Trinity or whatever it might be. You see what some of these older guys had to say about it. So you can go online and, and check it out and see what they, what they had to say. And Dag is another one. He's, he's pretty simple. Uh, you know, he's probably the Grudem of his day. Uh, he's, he's pretty simple reading and uh, right to the point, kind of short chapters. So um, I'd really recommend him. Another one I want to mention uh, is Millard Erickson, really Christian Theology in 1985. And this one I mentioned because it was used for years and years as a textbook in, uh, in seminaries before Grudem came along. And uh, even now, sometimes it's used, in especially in some of the Baptist uh, schools. But, um, and um, <clears throat> kind of basically a four-point Calvinist uh, and, and had some not as conservative viewpoints as, as some of the others. Okay, so so there's our schedule. So that's some reading, just some background uh, information for you, uh, other sources that you can look at, and there's a lot more. 
Uh, there's a lot of theology books. Uh, but here's our schedule we're kind of looking at. So tonight, just going to kind of introduce things. Uh, weeks two through four, not knowing God through uh, his revelation. Weeks five through nine, what God is like, the nature of God. And weeks 10 through 12, what God does, the work of God. Okay, so let's, let's get right into this uh, tonight. Studying God is what we're talking about. Now, here's a big word for you. Theology is full of big words, okay? And, uh, and sometimes not necessary, necessarily for us to talk about them, sometimes helpful. And um, so this can be a little bit helpful. Prolegomena is the word. And uh, it's, a, it's a Greek word, which literally means to say beforehand. So pro is before. Okay, in, in Greek, before. Uh, legan is, comes from the, um, um, the idea of, of saying something, of speaking. So to say beforehand is the idea. Now, I'm, I'm bringing this up because what a lot of times what we do is we get straight into the discussion of theology. We'll start talking about the Bible. We'll start talking about God. We'll go straight there without realizing that there's something that comes before that in our thinking process. And so it is impossible to undertake any task, not just theology, but any task without presuppositions and without some bias on our part. We go into it with a certain bias and presupposition. And uh, this reality is the case with theology as well. And we just need to admit it up front. And we need to realize it. Now, this is what the unbelieving world will tell us. They'll say, well, you just, you've already got your mind made up about these things and you go into it. In a certain sense, that's true. I mean, we may not be totally closed-minded in our minds, but we've already got our presuppos presuppositions and biases. But so do they. So does everyone. And that's what we need to admit. There, there's presuppositions when we come to talk about theology. And we need to acknowledge that that's the case. And so a name has been given to this idea of the presuppositions that we have in regard to um, uh, any theological system that we have. And that name is prolegomena. What we say beforehand, before we ever get to the discussion of theology. So, when we're talking about prolegomena, we're talking about the introduction to the actual discussion of theology itself. So this deals with presuppositions and principles um, of, of our theological discussion. So, um, this is what we recognize when we come to the discussion of theology. Now, also at the same time, what I would say, what we need to recognize is that our prolegomena, that is our, our principles that we approach this with our presuppositions, should be theological informed, theologically informed. It's not just that we, we grab them out of the sky and say, well, this is my presupposition, so therefore this is what I'm going to believe about theology. No, even our presuppositions need to be theologically formed. And they are, whether we, we admit that or not. And, and so our presuppositions may actually change, you see, as we go along in our theology, as we learn things about God and about ourselves and his creation, about the Bible and about all the stuff we're going to talk about. Well, that may change how we actually come to approach theology. Uh, but... It should be based on theology itself. So what we're talking about is not pre-theological. We're talking about the introduction to theology. It's actually theologically informed as well. All our presuppositions should be as well. But they are there, and that's what we want to recognize. We do have presuppositions. So with that in mind, let's define what we're talking about. What is theology? Well, again, here we go. Theology, theos, means God. It's a, it's a word for God. And logos, or logos, is the word for word, or reason, or logic. Uh, so, when we're talking about 
theology, what we're talking about is the study of God. The study of God. Simply that. And uh, to be more specific, and this is what I'm going to put before you tonight, it's an ordered study or ordered consideration of God. Now, theology um, is not, so theology is the study of God, but theology is not necessarily a pure biblical word. In other words, you're not going to go in the Bible and, and find where God commands us to study theology. You know, you need to take a course in systematic theology. That's just not there in the Bible. Uh, but while it's not there literally, it is there in the Bible, right? We're supposed to know God. We study the Word of God. That is His, his revelation. So we come to know God in, in that sense. So theology is the study of God, is the thinking about God. And so in some sense, all Christians are theologians, right? We think of theologians as a particular calling and career and that kind of thing and it, it can be but also every single individual christian is supposed to be a theologian right? because we study god we want to know god so this is why this is is so important to us so what i'm going to set forth is that we there are certain aspects to what we're going to talk about so first when we talk about studying god when we talk about theology and specifically systematic theology we're going to talk more about what that means in just a minute. But number one, it involves the rational aspect of man. It involves knowledge. Okay, so that's our thinking process, our rational process. Augustine in The City of God defines theology as rational discussion respecting the deity. Now, this doesn't mean that our affections are not involved. It also doesn't mean that there are not moral or ethical aspects to theology, but the rational aspect is the predominant aspect involved with theology. It's the predominant part of man that is involved with studying God. So theology is... That aspect of God, uh, the rational aspect of theology, is that aspect that stands out uh, above all else. So it involves the rational aspect of man. We just need to understand that. So this is thinking. This is something we've got to, to, to think through in regard to knowing God. Second, it involves understanding the interrelationship of aspects of theology. Let me give you a quote here. Um, this is E.Y. Mullins. He says, Systematic theology is the orderly and harmonious presentation of the truths of theology with a view to unity and completeness. Okay, this, is, this is something I'm going to be emphasizing now. I want you to get in your mind. This is, this is what we're talking about with systematic theology. Okay, so, so it's systematic. We know what something systematic is. You, you put it in a certain system. There's a certain order to it. And, and, and why is this important? It is important because it brings unity and completeness. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about uh, that as we, we move along. So it's important we understand the rational aspect of this, the systematic aspect. And, and while that's important... I don't want us to lose focus here. What we don't want to change the focus of what theology should be and, and where the focus should be. So I'm saying the rational is the most important aspect in regard to this, um, but it's not still not the primary thing. the The primary thing in regard to theology is believing the primacy of God's revelation. Okay, so our focus has to be on God, not on ourselves, not on our rational aspect. That is a tool to know God. It's a means by which we, we know God, the rational is. But primarily in theology, we keep on going back to God's revelation. He has revealed himself to us. He's created us with a mind so that we can know him and therefore believe in him. But it, it is the revelation of God which is 
so important. Baving says dogs, dogmatics, which is theology, gets all its material from revelation and does not have the right to modify or expand that content by speculation apart from that revelation. So everything has to be tied to God's revelation. And the reason for this, this is a little bit of extended quotes, so I'm going to put it up here for you. The, the reason for this, he says, is that God's thoughts cannot be opposed to one another, and thus necessarily from an organic unit, and, and thus necessarily form an organic unity. Uh, that's important. I want to pause here just a minute. That's important because a lot of times we present this, present God as if he's, he's opposed to himself. You know, there's contradictions, there's paradoxes, and and all these kind of things. I understand that we, we don't understand them, and there's apparent paradoxes there in, in our minds. But what Bavink is saying is so true. God is, is not schizophrenic here. You know, God is, is very much um, in control of his, his own thoughts and his own revelation. And so he says, the imperative task of the dogmatician is to think God's thoughts after him and to trace their unity. Accordingly, he does not come to God's revelation with a ready-made system in order, as best he can, to force, it, to force its content into it. On the contrary, he says, even in his system, a theologian's sole responsibility is to think God's thoughts after him and to reproduce the unity that is, listen, objectively present in the thoughts of God and has been recorded for the eye of faith in Scripture. That such a unity exists in the knowledge of God contained in Revelation is not open to doubt. To refuse to acknowledge it would be to fall into skepticism, into a denial of the unity of God. A. H. Strong says, The aim of theology is the ascertainment of the facts respecting God and the relations between God and the universe and the exhibition of these facts in their rational unity as connected parts of a formulated and organic system of truth. Theology is therefore a summary and explanation of the content of God's self-revelations. Okay, so what I've said so far is it involves our minds. It involves our rational process. Knowledge. You've got to have knowledge in order to understand God. And then second, when we're talking about systematic theology, what we're going through here, it involves understanding the interrelationship of aspects of theology. We bring it all together in a unity. And, and that's the way we have to understand it because that's the way God operates. He is, he is unity himself. He, there's not... Uh, he's not broken into parts. Okay, some other aspects to it. Three, it involves a community aspect. Okay, so both the historical church and the contemporary church are involved in the work of theology. This is something that's often missing in our discussion of theology. We look at this as me, me and God. You know, it's just me as an individual before God trying to learn about God. But the theologian should be drawing on the accumulated knowledge of the historical church and should also work in consultation with the present church, with the contemporary church, in order to develop theological understanding into a clearer and more helpful system of understanding God and His creation. So it's the church and not merely an individual that should be involved in the process of theology. And, and the church is ultimately what will approve or disapprove of your theology or any individual's theology. So, so this is very important. I mean, we do this in, in almost everything else in our existence, right? I mean, I was talking to somebody today, I was saying, you know, we, you don't go and fix a car, just on your own. You don't come up with the idea, if, if you have the knowledge, to, to fix something on a car. Just, oh, I just dream this up. You know? 
No, there were engineers who built that car. There's been instruction manuals. There's mechanics who have figured out how to work on this stuff. They've told us these things. It's, it's come through a pro science itself, right? The advancement, of that, not, somebody doesn't just come up on their own one day and say, oh, I've discovered everything there is to know about science. Yeah. No, we're building on those who have gone before us, right? So that's the way humanity works. There's the collective knowledge that exists. This is why we can make the advances we do. And the same thing in the church. We can advance in our understanding of things because we can draw on some of these theologies I set up here a few minutes ago. These guys who went before, who were drawing off others who went before them and others around them, they weren't just doing this on their own. It was a collective sense of bringing this all together. And that's, that's the way we should do theology. That's why the local church is so important. We don't just come up with our interpretations of Scripture and the way our practice in the Christian life and say, hey, this is it, I've arrived, I've done it. No, we, we come together with the church. And this is the way that we live out the Christian life. And it's no different with theology itself. Burkhoff points out that Christian theology is built upon historical facts inscripturated thousands of years ago. And theology is the interpretation of those facts. And he points out that, that no one Christian can ever hope to succeed in assimilating and, and reproducing properly the whole content of the divine revelation. Neither is one generation able to accomplish the task. The formation of dogmas is the task of the church of all ages a task which requires great spiritual energy on the part of successive generations. And so he says again, religious dogmas are not the product of the individual Christians, but of the church as a whole. It is only in communion with all the saints that believers can understand and confidently reproduce the truth. I see, and this is, uh, this is something we're missing in modern day America. We've got our individualism and, and what many in the leaders in the church today are calling us back to is this community aspect. And um, I think Cody touched on this with the Great Commission of Missions and this kind of thing. Okay, is, is everybody supposed to go to the foreign mission field? All Christians? Well, if we do, then there's no Christians left here. So now we've got to send people back here. No, this is the Great Commission is given to the church. It's given to the church. And not everybody baptizes, right? There's, there's certain people in the church that, that carry out the function of baptism. This is part of the Great Commission. You're not, not everybody's called to baptize, I don't believe. I, I believe this is the function of the church. And somebody gets converted, and, and we don't have 50 people in the church go up to baptize that one person, right? No, we, what do we do? It's the church that is involved in the Great Commission. And the same thing with theology. It's the church that is involved in with theology it fourth is meant to be communicated so this isn't just for us oh i've i've arrived rationally now I've, i understand this i've got this knowledge about god well why are you want to study about god just to get this knowledge for yourself well it certainly will help you in your sanctification process hopefully and help you in, in this way as a, as a person but it's also meant to be communicated when we do theology we want to communicate it to people so we want to be able to, to help other people with their Christian walk. We, we want to teach other people. It's also meant to be lived. That's the fifth thing, is, is meant to be lived. John Frame argues that theology should be defined as the application of God's Word by persons in all areas of life. Uh, so... What we're talking about, when we're talking about systematic theology, we're not talking about something that is just theoretical. In some sense it is, right? I mean, you've got to have theory behind the practice. But we're really talking about something that's supposed to be lived out. Something that's supposed to show itself um, in our lives and in the life of the church. Okay, so in light of that, everybody's got their, their definitions. You'll see one in uh, Grudem's Systematic Theology. So, so this is one that I'll just put out there for us. This is what we're talking about. Okay, over this 12 weeks, over the 
later parts that will come. Systematic theology. Systematic theology is the study of revealed facts about God and his creation. Now, when we're talking about this study, this systematic theology, study of revealed facts about God's creation, what it then seeks to do is to connect those revealed facts into an organized system. Okay, so we're not just talking about a fact here and a fact there and a fact over here. We're, we're taking the facts of God's Word, the revelation of God's Word, and we're bringing them together into an organized system that then is going to show a rational unity for the purpose that God's truth will then be believed and applied to all areas of life. Now, with that in mind, um, there, there's different categories involved that, that maybe will help us help you understand uh, what, where we're going with this and, and where it's different from some of the other things we're doing uh, in the Institute here. Um, the first category that I'll mention is, is really what Cody was doing uh, last time with his Bible course, and that's what is called uh, biblical or exegetical theology. And um, biblical, in, or sometimes called exegetical theology, is really the study of different authors, parts or themes of the Bible, in order to see the particular viewpoint or emphasis of these in the context of the unity of the Bible. There, there's all kind of different ideas of what biblical theology is out there. I mean, we're not going to take time to talk about all the different approaches. This is, this is basically what I mean. You're, so in other words, you're studying the Bible. So you study Paul, and you see his theology in the Bible. You study John, because he wrote a number of New Testament books, and you study how he presents uh, theology of things. Uh, so, so you're looking at the Bible, in certain aspects of the Bible, where, where, whether it be themes or authors or, or whatever, you're looking at those and you're saying, okay, well, this is, this is the theology of the Bible according to the way Paul presents it or the way John presents it or Jesus presents it or whatever, or, or, or Moses in the first five books of the Bible, whatever it is, you know. Um, that's that's kind of the, uh, the approach that you're taking with, with biblical theology. Then there's what's called historical or ecclesiastical theology. And this is what uh, I did last time I taught. It was church history, basically. But it's the idea of, of studying theology from the history. So you see what Augustine uh, believed about, about God and about sin. Or um, Calvin, what, he, what the Reformers believed. So you're looking back in the history of the church and you're saying, okay, this time this is what they believed about um, theology. And the third is what we're talking about uh, now, which is systematic or sometimes called dogmatic theology. And um, so as I said, it's like the word says, it's systematic. You're getting a system uh, together. You're, you're, you're taking the different aspects of theology in the Bible, different verses, different, different things that are taught, and you're, you're bringing, so for instance, the Trinity, okay? Um, well, there's not a verse in the Bible that says, okay, God exists in, in, in Trinity. There's a triune aspect to God, and you need to understand it. And this is what it consists of, and how it looks, and how it fleshes itself out. The Bible doesn't do that for us. So, so when we're going to talk to somebody about the Trinity, we, we have to take from the Bible that teaching and and all the different, from Genesis to Revelation, we look at it and we say, okay, this is where it looks like the Bible's talking about God existing in Trinity. And, and so this is what we mean by that when we go to the Muslim and we explain to them, and they're thinking we're worshiping three gods. Well, what, what are we going to do with that? Well, we can look at it from a biblical aspect. We can take them through the whole Bible. We can do that. That's biblical theology. We can, we can do that. But we can also say, topically, basically, in a system, this is, this is what we mean by this. This is the theology of the Trinity. 
And then there's um, kind of a fourth aspect to it, and that is practical theology. And um, A.H. Strong defines it for us. He says, practical theology is a system of truth considered as a means of renewing and sanctifying men, or in other words, theology in its publication enforcement. So in other words, we take our systematic theology, now we say, okay, we, we want to live this out. We want to see what it looks like. And so, so often in these, what we're talking about is prayer, worship, um, these kinds of things, holy living, you know, these kind of what we would consider more, more practical uh, things. So those are kind of different categories, and that's where we're fitting this. And hopefully they'll see, say, okay, now I see. So Cody did biblical theology basically last time as he did the Bible survey. Um, what, and, and in a sense, missions is the practical theology. I did church history, so we looked at the historical. But right now what we're talking about is, is systematic theology. We're talking about this, this way of systematizing things. And we're not going to really talk about this uh, so much. There's debate among the theologians as to wh what do you call this? What do you actually do? I just want to mention this debate with the different names so that when you're looking, you see these, like uh, I mentioned, Bavink with Reform Dogmatics. That's the title of his book. What does that mean, Dogmatics? Uh, well, this is the way they're referring. It's, it's systematic theology. That's what we're calling systematic theology. And, and so you may see these different titles out there. Systematic theology, divinity, dogmatic theology, or whatever it might be. They're, they're all basically referring to uh, the same thing here um, that, that I'm talking about tonight, which is um, systematic theology. But why do we even need to do this? Okay, What is the need for doing systematic theology. Because you got a lot of people who argue that it's not necessary. Okay? It's a distraction. It's unspiritual. You know, just give me the Bible. That's what I want. Just give me the Bible. And it says, hey, okay, yeah, just give me the Bible. But of course, we know, again, from looking at church history, that there are a lot of guys who are saying, give me the Bible, and that's all we need, that's all we should be talking about, who are teaching heresy. And they were using the Bible. They were using the same kind of terminology that other Christians were using. Same words, everything else. But they were teaching something very different than the Orthodox Church was teaching. And this is why the need for the creeds and confessions of faith and this kind of thing. Because they said, okay, we've got to define what this is. In a sense, outside of the Bible. That's what we do in preaching, right? We, we don't just get up and read the Bible. We expound on it. We, we say things beyond the Bible. Hopefully true to the Bible, but beyond what the Bible specifically says. And this is what theology does for us. So there are, are three primary reasons for the necessity of systematic theology. And then I'm going to expand a little bit uh, beyond these. But these, these, are, these are pretty simple. Uh, one is the struggle against false doctrine. This is what I mentioned a moment ago. Okay, there's false teachers out there who will use the same kind of words we do. They claim to be Christians. They claim to believe just like we do. But when you press them a little bit more, you find out, no, in fact, they're undercutting true Christianity. And so we need, in the struggle against false doctrine, to, to sometimes systematize our beliefs, to, to state them clearly so that they can see. Also, in regard to teaching true doctrine, not just combating the false doctrine, but teaching the true doctrine, we need to, um, sometimes it's helpful to systematize things, to use systematic theology to help people understand certain truths. And then third, I would say it contributes to biblical exegesis. So the study of Scripture, that's what exegesis basically means, preaching, study of Scripture, teaching scripture, these kind of things. Systematic theology can help in regard to that. But beyond these three primary reasons, there are also more detailed reasons as to why we need to be using systematic theology to learn about the Christian faith. And, and here's some of those reasons. 
Number one, Christianity is based on truth. Belief in the truth is primarily rational. I'm going back to what I talked about earlier. So Christianity is not merely a life, living the Christian life, or a relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, now, now that may be shocking to some people. It may be shocking to what you hear sometimes. because some, I've heard it preached and taught, even by some conservative preachers. Don't worry about doctrine. Worry about your relationship with Christ. Well, that's putting a dichotomy in place that Jesus never put in place. Um, Christianity is belief in Christ. That is a doctrinal statement in and of itself. You say you believe in Christ, that's a doctrinal statement. That's a theological statement. Christianity means knowledge. And if you, if you read the book of John, you read the book of Romans, if you read Paul's letters, if, if you read the New Testament, if you read the you'll see this idea of knowledge over and over again. You, you know, what is knowledge? It, it's not just some nebulous spiritual thing out there. It's the thinking process. It's our minds at work. This is the way God made us. Theology, uh, someone has said, is necessary because truth and experience are related. Truth will affect our experience. So Christianity is based on truth. Belief in the truth is primarily rational. Not only rational, but it is primarily rational. That's why this is important. Second, the direct and indirect injunctions of Scripture. That is the teaching of Scripture itself. Again, uh, already says all through the, the Scripture, Jesus um, talks about searching the Scriptures. Um, there's just many, many, uh, too many for us uh, to look at in the time we have tonight. But uh, you, know, you know the Scripture passages that call us to know God and, and know Christ. Third, the unity of the church calls for theological agreement. Again, we're talking about reasons why we need systematic theology, why we even need this course. One reason is if we want the church to be unified, we've got to know theology. We have to know what is to be believed. We are to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints, Jude tells us. Uh, the, the unity of the church is, is not just getting together. It's not just serving together. In the scripture, it is found in doctrinal agreement. Now, it doesn't mean we, we have to be in total, absolute agreement about everything in order to do ever, anything with other Christians, fellowship with other Christians, because we, we never have fellowship, right? So, uh, but it does mean that there must be theological agreement if we're going to come together in unity as a church. We can't, can't be in unity with false believers, with false teachers. So, in other words, we have to know what we believe. We have to know what other people believe. There has to be some kind of system in place to say, this is what we believe. Again, somebody can say, oh, it's just the Bible. Believe the Bible. Okay, try that out. See how it works for you. you know, see how you agree with the false believers and false teachers who are saying they only hold to the Bible as well, just like you do. And let them start teaching in your church. Let them start teaching in your groups, in your schools. And find out pretty quick that what they're teaching is heresy, is something that you disagree with as a Christian. And there's got to be some kind of system in place for proclaiming what the theological agreement is. Okay, so fourth, uh, let's get that up there, Fourth, the spread of the gospel requires it. We're talking about missions, right? Well, what is the gospel? Okay, we, we've got to know what the gospel is. Uh, so the spread of the gospel requires theological clarity. If the gospel is truth, and we believe 
than it is, it is required that those professing the truth know what the truth is so that they will know when others have even accepted it or when they have rejected it, for that matter. And if you don't know what the, what the truth of the gospel is, how are you going to know when people have, have come to Christ or not? In order to carry out his task, the church must not allow error to mix with truth. So missions and theology go together. Churches need to know what other churches believe so they will know how much they can cooperate together with those churches in order to spread the truth. And then systematic theology is an extension of the teaching function of the church. It, it helps the church to disciple followers of Jesus Christ, which is what we're called to do in the Great Commission, make disciples of Jesus Christ. Well, this helps us to do that. So, so the spread of the gospel requires theology. Fifth, it is human nature to attempt to harmonize true facts because this is the way that God's mind operates. Okay, so here's one of my presuppositions, right? This is, a, this is a, a presupposition I'm operating from in regard to theology. And I'm operating this way because this is what I see in Scripture. I see that God's mind um, is, is, works in this way. That there is unity within the mind of God Himself. And He has made us in His image. Because he has made us in the way that he has, it is then our human nature to attempt to harmonize. We don't like things all out of, we don't like chaos in terms of things. I mean, again, I can use all kinds of illustrations here, but the uh, medical profession. I mean, you don't want a surgeon who doesn't harmonize the facts about your human body and how all this works. Oh, we're just going to cut them open and we're not worried about germs. No, you want him harmonizing everything we know about medical science to bring together as he, as he operates on you. So this is, this is by nature what we, what we do. Uh, six, knowing how different facts relate together gives us greater understanding. So um, we have isolated facts out here in our world. Eh, that's okay. It's good to know this, and it's good to know this, and this over here. That's all very interesting and helpful with trivia things and, and all this kind of stuff. But we really can't know what God has revealed in his word unless we understand, and, and Charles Hodge has said this, at least in some good measure, the relation in which the separate truths stand to each other. What's the relation between this truth over here and this truth? What's the, for instance, what's the relation between Jesus as a human being and Jesus as divine? And the scripture claims that Jesus is, is God, and over here it's obvious he's a man. But what do we do with that? Well, the best way to understand Jesus is by bringing what the scripture says together in the person of Jesus Christ. So, Again, harmonizing these things is important. Okay, seven. Teaching truth requires systematizing God's revelation because that is the best way to manifest and defend God's truth. Uh, we've already talked about this uh, a little bit and why it's necessary. Uh, eight. God doesn't systematize these truths for us. He leaves, us, leaves it for us to do. So this is why systematic theology is necessary. He doesn't systematize it for us. He leaves it for us to do it. So if we want them systematized, we've got to do it. And then ninth, uh, theology influences practice. Practice is based on theology. So not only is orthodoxy, which is right belief about God, right worship of God, uh, important, so is orthopraxy, so the right practice of, of God. So why is systematic theology necessary? It is necessary because our theology influences our practice. We don't just live in a vacuum. We live out what we believe. Even for that person that says, I have nothing, I don't care, I'm not going to think about it, I'm not going to have any theories, no, I'm just going to live life. Well, they've, got, they've just stated their belief, right? And they're going to live that way. And they're going to live out what they believe. That's just the way it works. So it's, it's much more important that we would um, 
have a, a clear understanding of what we believe, and through this process, God sanctifies us so that then we live the right way that we should live as, as Christians. Okay, so that kind of introduces us to, um, to the need for theology. And um, uh, let me just say quickly, you know, we're going to wrap this up real quick here, but, but we need to approach this correctly also as we move forward because it's possible to do theology wrong, obviously, just like it's possible to do anything wrong. So we, anytime you approach God, you need to do it in a prayerful way. Uh, we need, and, and when it comes to theology, knowing God, studying God, then then we need to pray that God will will illuminate our our minds, our understanding, so that we would know Him correctly, because we want the truth. Uh, that's so important for us. So, so we want to pray for that truth, and and obviously, if this is so important, what we're saying is there's a reverence for the truth as well. Okay, so we revere. The truth, because the, the truth is a display of, of God himself. Which means also that we need to be teachable, and we need to be humble. I've, I've, I know a lot of Christians that when they get hold of theology, become haughty and prideful and arrogant and mean towards other people. Uh, how, can, how can that be? When you're, when you're striving to know God, how can you not be humble? So, so this idea of, of theology and studying theology, systematic theology, should humble us. Because one of the things that should do is give us an incredible vision of God, how great God is. And the only way we know how great He is if, is if He reveals Himself to us. We can't conjure this up on our own. So that right there should make us pretty humble, right? We have no way to access God unless He reveals Himself to us. And the only thing we know is by His grace. The only spiritual gifts you have, the only spiritual knowledge you have, is because of His grace revealing it to you. So the most gifted theologian in the world, the most knowledgeable theologian in the world, should be acknowledging the only way he has reached that point is because God brought him to that point. And he could have just as easily brought somebody else to that point but he chose to bring him to that point. This should create incredible humility on our part. And so therefore, should cause us to love others and be gracious towards others. And more than anything else, what we should be desiring after this is what God desires after it, which is his glory. And so we recognize, again, staying humble, that there's limitations. There can be limitations as we move forward in this. It's because we study systematic theology, and I, I've read a number of these systematic theologies. I don't say that to, to boast in any way. I've lived long enough and had interest long enough to do it. Um, but what I've come to realize is there's limitations. And, uh, and an awful lot of that limitation is because of me. And because of God, who He is. God is infinite. I am not. I am far from it. And that's what we recognize as a human being. There's, there's only so much God has revealed to us. There's only so much we can understand. And, and so we, we come before God as we, we approach this now for these next few weeks. And we say, God, show us. Teach us. Be our teacher in regard to these things. Help us to learn all that we can, but recognize that through all this, God still sits on his throne. We're way down here, and there's only so much that we can know uh, about God and who he is. But we want to know what we can. We desire to know that. Um, and so this is why this is a great priority for us to, to study God. Okay, with that in mind, let me, let me dismiss us with a word of prayer, and thank you for your attention. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your goodness toward us, for your greatness. You are indeed a great God for revealing yourself to us through your word, for giving us Jesus Christ, and for giving us this opportunity to learn about you and your purposes in the creation. 
So help us, Lord, as we read and as we move forward in this study, that indeed this will be for your glory and for our edification as we live out this truth and desire to live it out for our Lord Jesus Christ, who is truth himself. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.